Welcome to the Cleveland Orchestra's On a Personal Note, where we explore the many ways music shapes our lives. In difficult situations or moments of sheer joy, music connects us with our humanity. I'm Lisa Wong, Director of Choruses for the Cleveland Orchestra. This is my third year in this position and my 11th year in the organization altogether. Robert Shaw was um, invited to Cleveland by George Sell, and he was invited here to, to develop a chorus that could sing at the same level as the Cleveland Orchestra. He has said very publicly that one of the the main reasons that he accepted that invitation was because he wanted to come to Cleveland to learn. Robert Shaw was always so incredibly demanding. He wanted the rhythm to be as precise as the rhythm of the orchestral musicians. He was a stickler for precision in text. He established that foundation, he and and George Sell together. And in the, the subsequent directors, I feel that that has continued to be a primary goal. Through the the bulk of my career, I never really thought of myself as a female conductor or a female teacher. Quite honestly, I, I just thought of myself as, you know, Lisa the conductor or Lisa the teacher. That's just who I was. And it wasn't until I started teaching at the College of Worcester when my students, who are extraordinarily bright and thoughtful, but they they used to draw my attention to the significance of me being a female conductor. I certainly never purposefully disconnected that part of my identity, but I, I didn't, I just didn't understand the weight that it carries to so many young musicians and and young people who are looking for role models and they're looking looking for women, they're looking for people of color. It's almost like they had to state the obvious for me to, to see it so clearly. But now I understand certainly in this position, which is so public and so high profile, how important it is to have a woman in in this role and i'm i'm very thankful for that the piece that i've chosen to share with you today is john adams on the transmigration of souls John Adams was commissioned by the New York Philharmonic to compose a piece on the one-year anniversary of September 11th. And at first, he was a little bit reluctant to accept this commission. That's that's got to be a daunting task um, for a composer to to write a piece with such a, a tragic event as its genesis. Ultimately, he accepted the commission, but he knew he didn't want to compose a piece that would, that was designed to, to tug on the emotional heartstrings. 
So what he ultimately decided to do was to create what he calls a memory space. And there couldn't be a more perfect description of this piece. Every time that I listen to the piece, it pulls me right back to 9-11. It makes me think about where I was at that time and what I was doing in the days and the weeks immediately following. And I think that that's got to be personal, probably for every listener. It starts off, um, there, there's a pre-recorded track of voices, spoken voices, and city sounds like footsteps and cars and sirens and things like that. And as soon as you hear those sounds, it's as if he's transporting you to New York. And then you hear these spoken voices. He starts with just a young boy who keeps saying, missing, missing. missing. And then we hear other voices reciting the names of people who were missing. And when the chorus finally comes in, it's this distant, ethereal, wordless passage. And again, it it transports you again. It sort of, it, it takes out the sounds of the city a bit and brings you to this otherworldly experience. John Florio, Christina Flynn, Lucy Fishman, Richard John Florio, Lucy Fishman, Richard Stina Flynn, Missing, John Florio, Missing, John Florio, Christina Flynn, Missing, Edith, John Florio, David Flynn, Missing, Edith, Joseph W. Flynn, David Flynn, John, Missing. There used to be um, a column every day in the New York Times that would share these anecdotes about the victims. And so he pulled lines from those and set them as part of this piece. And I will say that was a very difficult part to prepare with the chorus because... um, I'm always asking the chorus to be more and more engaged with the text. But asking them to engage with a text like this, where there are lines like, he used to call me every day. I'm just waiting, or I know just where he is. I wanted to dig him out. These are words that are just hard to even say right now or hard to read, but to have to rehearse them and sing them again and again and again was challenging in so many ways. The chorus always has the opportunity to do a little bit of a warm-up rehearsal down in the Rheinberger Chamber Hall. So we did our warm-up, and then at the end of the warm-up, we talked about, you know, this is a piece that we've now lived with for, for a couple of months in preparation. But so many of the audience members are going to be hearing this for the first time. And I wanted the chorus 
to be prepared for this to be a really emotional experience. And I said, you don't know how the audience is going to react, and you don't know how you are going to react sharing these very difficult and emotional texts with our community. So I just wanted to to prepare them for that and for them to, in some ways, expect, really, I mean, for, for anything to happen. At the end of the piece, the conductor held the silence for an unusually long period of time, and there was no applause, which I I thought was, was very appropriate. But in that silence, you could hear members of the audience just weeping and sobbing. So it it clearly had an emotional impact on the performers and the audience alike. So if you think back to the time of 9-11, you might remember that there was spontaneous singing and people would gather in groups and they would sing God Bless America or Amazing Grace, songs like that. And this wasn't anything planned. This wasn't anything formalized. But I think it speaks to the incredible power of music to be a healing force. And music is something that that people need, even if they don't realize that they need it. And so there was sort of a, a collective communal cry for music. And so even now, 20 years after 9-11, there still is this emotional response um, from, from this piece. And even though I consider this piece to be very personal, there is something even more powerful about experiencing something so personal and so intimate with a large group of people, whether that's a large group of audience members, a large group of musicians on stage, there's there's something very moving and very powerful about that. In a similar time now where people are cut off from one another, where we're all distanced, and what are people looking toward? They're looking toward music. People are singing from their rooftops in Italy. People are singing out their windows in New York City. And again, people may not have realized that this is what they needed until it was taken away. And, you know, we're, we're all finding our way again in music. We're finding out what is safe, what's, what's not. How can we perform together again? When will that be possible? I did an interview earlier this spring, and somebody asked me, what what literature, what piece are you most looking forward to, um, to singing with the chorus? And I said, what I am most looking forward to is that first rehearsal, that first moment when we get to take that collective communal breath and we when we can finally just open our mouths to sing and and to be a community again.
Lisa Wong chose John Adams on the Transmigration of Souls, a piece that helped a nation remember and heal together. We invite you to listen, remember, and heal right along with us when we play the piece in full in just a moment. It was recorded at Severance Hall in 2019. And if you're enjoying on a personal note, we would love it if you would subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and consider giving us a rating and review. Follow us at clevelandorchestra.com slash podcast. Missing. 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 John Florian. Missing. John Florian. Missing. John Florian. Lucy Fishman. Missing. John Florian. Lucy Fishman. Richardina Flannery. Missing. John Florian. Missing. John Florian. John Florio, David Missing.
eye color, hazel. Hair color, brown. Eye color, hazel. Hair color, Weight, 180 pounds. Please call 212-799-81. We love you, chick.
Alexis Ledoc, Betsy Martinez, Brian McGee, Christopher Larrabee, Daniel Mayer, Dennis Lavelle, Edward J. Lemon, Elena Ladesma, Eugene Lazar, Gary E. Lasco, Hamidou S. Larry, James Leahy, Juan Garcia, Juanita Lee, Michael Tadonio, Janine Laverde, Edward Mazzola, Jeffrey Latouche, John D. Lee, Juan Garcia, John Adam Larson, John J. Lennon, Jose Luis Leon, Kevin D. Marlowe, Lizzie Martinez Calderon, Michael Lepore, David Fontana, I love you, Nicholas C. Lassman. I see water and buildings, Paul Richard Martini, I see water and buildings, Richard Y.C. Lee. Donald A. Foreman. Alicia Karen Levine. Frederick Gabler. Betsy Martinez, my sister. Maria Lavash. My mother. Frederick Gabler. you. 